As a Native American, I almost felt like we we're born into politics, like my life and my existence is political, that I want Native people to succeed and be heard. And that was always deemed as political by other people. I'm used to having to fight a little bit for these kinds of rights and opportunities. That's Rosalie Fish, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Hey guys, I'm your host, Kara Duffy, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast, where I invite my favorite humans, the awesome, the up to something, and the extraordinary to come and share their story. I hope that you'll be left entertained, inspired, and moved to take action towards living your most powerful life. Rosalie Fish appeared on ESPN and news stations globally when, at her high school state championship track meet last spring, She ran with a red handprint on her face and MMIW on her leg to bring awareness to the missing and murdered Indigenous women epidemic. In the U.S. and Canada, women in Indigenous communities are silenced when there is rape, when there is abuse, and police often ignore reports when Indigenous women go missing. I'm honored to have Rosalie, a young woman of the Muckleshoot tribe, on this episode of the Powerful Ladies podcast to provide her a platform to share her story and the story of her tribe. Well, thank you for being on the Powerful Ladies podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course, I'm honored. Um, let's start by um, telling everyone who you are and what you're up to. Okay, well, my name is Rosalie Fish. Um, I'm an 18 year old uh, Muckleshoot and Cowlitz tribal member. I recently graduated from Muckleshoot Tribal School and now I'm running um, collegiately at Iowa Central, um, a college in Fort Dodge. Very cool. And I actually was sent a picture of you from my boyfriend because he knows I'm always <laughs> looking for new powerful ladies. And he saw you come up on his um, Instagram feed through ESPN. So do you want to tell everyone how you ended up on ESPN? Sure. So last spring, or spring of 2019, in the track and field, I was a senior at Muckleshoot tribal high school where during my um, track and field season, I qualified for state championships. And through that, I dedicated the four races that I qualified for uh, to a missing or murdered indigenous woman in my community. And I represented them at um, state championships. And you did that by running with a red um, handprint across your face to symbolize Um, the silence and lack of attention that they're getting, correct? Yes. Yeah, it made for an amazing photo. So um, you are certainly on the marketing genius side, and I don't know um, (laughs) if you, did you realize the impact that you would have when you did that? Oh, absolutely not. Um, I had actually, I was inspired by a Boston Marathon runner. Her name is um, Jordan Marie Daniel. And she ran at the Boston Marathon with that very same handprint and with an acronym MMIW down her right leg. And so I had simply contacted her and asked her permission to use her idea and spread awareness where I was in the Pacific Northwest in Washington. And then um, the picture itself, actually, I didn't know it was taken until after state championships. Another Native photographer was at the championships just taking pictures for the athletes. And then when he saw me, he kind of had a vision of what kind of picture he wanted to take. And that's the one that people have been seeing constantly. What is it like to, to, you know, be a senior, be young in the eyes of the world and to have made such an impact? Um, It's definitely been very intimidating to know that there's that many people who had opinions about what I did or who maybe even were impacted by how I ran, but it also was very empowering to know that I was able to raise awareness for something that was really important to me. And I'm hoping that I can continue to do so or even inspire other youth to use their platforms and get their voices out there and get their their concerns you know, acknowledged. Yeah, I loved it. I, mean, I always think 
I believe that everybody has a really powerful voice and it's just a matter of, you know, how we use it. And I'm always really inspired by people who take what they're already doing in their everyday lives as an opportunity to make an impact. And you did it in such a um, eloquent way of, you know, of painting your face and then writing the initials down your leg. And you were making a big deal of something without causing a big deal. Like you did it within what you were there to do anyway. You still went out and performed. Um, Mm -hmm. You succeeded. And because of all of it combined together, there's something really beautiful when a, you know, quiet, gentle impact like gets heard that way. Um, Because not everyone is so lucky to, you know, people who are raising their voices and taking a stand on things don't always make it come together that way. So um, to me, it was really profound in, in how someone can make a difference every day in really simple gestures. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And I, um, it really all the credit for that really goes to you know, the you know, Native women who have been pressing for these issues above me, who mm-hmm. really moved me and, and taught me and guided me in, in this. They really were the ones who I went to through for teachings and especially Jordan. Jordan Daniel really was my mentor and still is, you know, through this process. For people who don't know the situation going on with the missing and murdered indigenous women, um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the murdered and missing indigenous women epidemic is sometimes considered as one of the longest Me Too movements. It's been going on for centuries in Native communities and really is trying to bring attention to the fact that Native women are extremely vulnerable to violence. Um, So a few few things that we've found, especially through like studies done by Urban Indian Health Institute is that, you know, um, murder is the third leading cause of death for Native women. And Native women are two times more likely to be raped than a white woman. And it's these kinds of Demographic are these statistics that put Native women as a demographic extremely vulnerable to psychological, sexual, and physical violence. What are the causes um, behind that? Um, like, what what's unique in mm-hmm. the communities that that create such high statistics? So we kind of when we look at the what's causing the epidemic and what's keeping it alive. Part of it is the historical trauma that comes with it through um, boarding schools and and reservations and no lack of acknowledgement that comes from um, the federal government to tribal lands and tribal laws. Mm -hmm. So there has been a lot of loopholes in which tribal um, affiliations aren't allowed to prosecute non-tribal offenders if a non-Native person assaulted a Native woman. You know, there's been a lot of cases in which there's been loopholes where the non-native person can get away with that. But also there comes um, a lot of systematic neglect where we found a lot of um, police stations and police reporters um, either refusing to take any kind of missing persons report or not taking it seriously or not documenting it correctly. And these are the kinds of issues that we've been addressing uh, through and in order to really acknowledge the epidemic, we have to acknowledge that these are some problems that are that are standing behind it. Do you see a difference in support and progress being made at a, a you know, county, state or, or versus a federal level? Like, are, where, where do you see the most progress happening? Yeah, I've definitely seen an amazing amount of progress in the Seattle area, considering that Seattle was the highest leading city in the murdered and missing indigenous women rates. And after my story, it was covered in the Seattle times, which already was really empowering to me to know that Seattle was addressing this issue, that they were taking this issue on, that they had realized that, wow, we are the highest leading city for missing and murdered indigenous women. And we're going to cover it. And then the next thing you know, I was getting calls from a congresswoman, Kim Schreier, had called me and told me personally that this was an issue that 
she wanted to take seriously. How cool. And along with, yeah, it was really, really inspiring to me to know that somebody did care who actually, who could, somebody who would take my voice and the voices of my community and the women in my community and amplify them. Mm-hmm. That was really empowering. And also they've been uh, recently Seattle held a conference to address the missing and indigenous women epidemic. And they actually brought in urban Indian health Institute, which is a really influential and um, hardworking institution that has been doing a lot of work for this epidemic. And now that they're getting these platforms and these opportunities, I think that we're really like on our way to make some changes. When did you become aware of this being an issue in your community? And when did you, you know, it's, when did you realize it was something that you wanted to be a voice for? Uh, With the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic, it wasn't really something that I learned about. It was just something that I realized had a name. Mm -hmm. Like I was, with the amount of women that are exposed to violence, it really kind of becomes normalized after growing up in that kind of environment. Yep. And then I realized as I got a little bit older and a little bit more involved in the social and political aspects that surround like Native Americans and reservations, I realized that it was an epidemic that wasn't just on my reservation or even in the Pacific Northwest, but it was happening across the nation and across continents in Canada. Uh, That was when I got a lot more passionate about the issue was when I realized that it's not just affecting my family and my community, it's affecting families and communities almost not worldwide, but through the, through the Northwest. And then when I saw Jordan Marie Daniel run at the Boston Marathon with the handprint, it made me realize that I could do more with my running and I had the opportunity to do so. When you say that you've been uh, impacted yourself, are there people in your immediate family that have been victims to this? Yes. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's definitely um, something that requires a lot of you know, healing and traditional, just traditional methods in order to really be able to speak about it in a way that you know you're going to make progress. Mm-hmm. But it's been... It's almost it's so normalized in these communities to, well, I'm not, what's the point of reporting it? Because I know they're going to tell me that when I report it to the police, they're going to, they're going to push it back. Mm-hmm. Like with Miss, Misty Upham, um, she was a native actress and she was raped at the Golden um, Grammy Awards. And then she went missing. And after she was reported, they waited 11 days to actually start looking for her. And by then, she was found in a ravine, and the police mislabeled her death as a suicide, despite there being evidence that it wasn't. And it's these kinds of reoccurring letdowns that make people feel hopeless. Yeah, it makes you feel like you don't have a voice, or your voice doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um When you think about, um, you know, growing up on a reservation and and being part of a a native indigenous community, um, what do you want people that haven't experienced that life to to know? I think one thing that's really important to acknowledge is, as a non-native, is to know that I wouldn't say that the reservation or Native Americans necessarily need saving as much as they need to be heard. Yep. And really, one of the issues that comes along with the violence against Native women is invisibility mm-hmm. and lack of acknowledgement. And I think if there were if you have an opportunity as a non-Native person to pass the mic, to pass the platform or and amplify the voice of Native people, I think that's the best way that you can really help Native women. Well, I'm honored that you're here so we can amplify your voice then. Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Of course. Do you feel a level of responsibility now that you've um, gained some notoriety in this area to, to, to carry this torch? Or are you, is it more of a, 
pride and honor that you've been chosen to have this spotlight? Uh, for me, I've always felt as if though I had a responsibility to you know, uphold and really support you know, my communities and other communities like mine. I would say that as a Native American, I almost felt like we're born into politics, like my life and my existence is political in a sense mm-hmm. that I want Native people to succeed and be heard. And that was always deemed as political by other people. So it almost, I would say that I'm used to being, I'm used to having to fight a little bit for these kinds of rights and opportunities. Do you feel that that's how other people on your reservation feel as well? Or is that unique to you? I would say that there are a lot of Native youth, especially who feel this way. I've seen a lot of Native youth not only take a stand on this epidemic, but also the climate change epidemic. Mm-hmm. And Native youth were, you know, stand, um, through the guidance of elders, the Native youth are taking stands on like, protecting lands and things like that. And so I really think that this generation and through the reconnecting with traditions and reconnecting with family and with elders that they're starting to find platforms in order to, to raise themselves and raise their communities. So I think, I think that this generation is really starting to find their voice. You know, not being non-native and not having a lot of exposure to um, reservation communities or that lifestyle the only things I know are statistics that I've heard through media, which I have no idea if they're accurate because usually they're not being reported by a Native person. So that automatically makes me question it, right? <laughs> um, yes. So I, you, know, you hear things like um, people leaving reservations in mass numbers. Um, you hear about um, you know, the population declining as a result. You hear about um, there being high levels of um, abuse, um, physical abuse and alcohol abuse. And um, you hear about, um, you know, there being not a lot of opportunities for people on reservations. What of those mm-hmm. things would you say are, are accurate or changing or like what, what, what do people need to know um, besides giving people a voice? Like what are, what's really going on in um, reservations today from your experience? Right now, what I know is each tribal reservation has a different environment. Some tribal reservations are able to provide resources for their communities and provide um, wellness centers and schools and mental health facilities, while other reservations, like the Pine Ridge Reservation, are left without electricity and running water. So I'd really say that it depends on each reservation individually. Mm -hmm. But I will say that all of the reservations I've been to, no matter where, I've always found a extremely strong sense of community and family and tradition. Mm -hmm. The the same things that um, tie most of us together, right? Yes. Yeah, I always it always surprises me that. As humans, we don't go back to the things that we have in common more often as a starting point. Um, you know, loving family and wanting the next generation to to do better and wanting to keep your traditions alive. Um, mm-hmm. No matter where I've gone in the world, that's those are all things that we have in common. And I don't know when it became a bad thing to celebrate everybody's unique um, experience and mm-hmm. to to share that versus try and make everything very homogenous. Right, yeah. And that's kind of um, something that I really appreciate about my reservation is knowing that I can come back and I won't be, you know, mocked for wearing my moccasins or for, try, for speaking my language or anything like that. It's almost, for me, my reservation personally is a safe place for me in the sense that I know I can go there and I can be myself and I can embrace you know, my heritage 
and I won't receive any kind of discrimination for that. Do you, do you feel that you can flow between your native heritage and like Western society and go back and forth and, and like express all of who you are? Like, how do you, how does that feel to you? And is that even an accurate um, example that I'm giving? I would say that it's not very difficult in order to, you know, ingrain native traditions in modern Western day Mm -hmm. traditions as well. I would say that just like with running, painting is very traditional and yet track and field and the way that we run it now is not traditional. Yet for me, it wasn't very difficult to combine the two. Mm Mm-hmm. I've seen that there are some tribes that have running as part of the um, like process of becoming an adult for different Native groups. Um, I've even seen a documentary where, um, like on a girl's birthday, she goes out and does these runs. Um, is that something that is in, um, is in your tribe as well? And is that something that you guys do? Or where, how does running fit into your heritage? I will say that because my tribe is a coastal tribe, so Mm -hmm. we're on the water, that my traditions more directly tie into um, canoes and fishing Mm -hmm. and um, cedar gathering and berry berry picking and things like that. But I do know other tribes, especially in the um, southwest area, that do have very... um, very strong ties to running through their culture and through their family. Mm-hmm. And I've I've had a few opportunities to run with some of the Native Americans that have that in their families. And they're very, very strong runners and very, you could tell that running is almost like a healing process and a grounding process for me and for the Natives that it in their families and their traditions as well. And I think that's something that's common of anyone who loves running, right? Like, mm-hmm. no matter your your background, if you, you know, they talk about the runner's high. Like, there's a place you get to where you realize it's bigger than you. And you're just, like, going through the motions and watching your body, like, keep running and run faster and feel like you're one with something bigger than you are. So the, the therapy mm-hmm. um, of running... And the confidence it gives you and the mental cleansing that it can, that is why most people I know run is, is for that. Like right. the health yeah. and fitness comes second. It's really like your mind needs it before your body yeah, exactly. does. Mm-hmm. How did you get into running? Uh, I started running in uh, middle school just because I really enjoyed the way it made me feel. And then when I got to tribal school, I was a freshman in high school. And it was definitely kind of a shift because I was the only runner on my team because the school was very small. Mm-hmm. And track and field wasn't didn't really have a legacy at Muckleshoot Tribal School yet. And so when I would show up to meet and I noticed that I was the only tribal school there and I sometimes would be put into the last lane, even though my time would put me in a different one. And I was treated sometimes just like less than, or I was underestimated a lot. Or even when sometimes when we'd have home meets or home games, we would have graffiti in the bathroom wall with racial slurs. And it was those kinds of things that really kept me running in the sense that I knew that I was representing Muckleshoot Tribal School, Muckleshoot Nation, and also even being all Indigenous people in a sense that I was a Native runner, Mm -hmm. and I was one of the only ones, if not the only one there. And I was defying perceptions of me that other people had. And so that was really what kept me running and what empowered me through running. It's so fun, isn't it, when you get to prove everyone wrong? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, even, you know, I think any time that I know me personally, if I'm being underestimated, I'm like, yes, this is going to be fun. 
Um, yeah, ex- yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, for those that don't know, which um, which uh, races are yours in track and field? What distances do you do? Um, normally, I usually only run the 3,200 meters and the 1,600 meters and the 800 meters. And at state uh, championships, I ran the 400 meters, but I wouldn't say that I run that regularly. Yeah. And now you're you're going to college, and you're going to be running in college as well? Yes. And um, what made you pick where you are going? And, you know, what was what was the process like for you going through the college application process and picking a school? So my coach brought Iowa Central up to me originally because at the time that I was trying to find a college, we knew that going straight to a four-year university would be a really big jump for me just because I would be going away from home and also from a small school and small running program to a huge school and a huge running program. So that's why we started looking at junior colleges, and that's when we found Iowa Central, and their women's team are 15 times uh, national champs in cross country. And so it was really, and then when I talked to the coach and I looked at his program, he not only had faith in my running ability when I didn't, but he also had faith in my character and my dedication. And so after speaking with the coach and learning about the success and history of the program, it just seemed like an opportunity I couldn't pass up. Are you running cross country as well as track and field there? Yes. It's currently cross-country season. Yeah. Uh, I was a college athlete as well. I played field hockey, and I got so much out of having a team, like, right away, right? Because you go for preseason, and you're doing all this prep, and you kind of instantly have a group of people that you can count on and hopefully become your friends. Um, What has it been like for you to go from a school that had a small team to almost no team, right? If it was to a place that is 15 times national championships and you know, you have all these other amazing runners around you. Yeah, it's definitely been really life-changing to be able to get up at 7 a.m. for my 11-mile run and know that there's going to be at least 40 other people who have to run just as long or longer, and they're going to be miserable right there with me. It's <laughs> really, yeah, really nice to know that I don't have to do it alone. Yeah. And did you say mm-hmm. 40 people have to run with you? Um, I think on our team, we have a little bit less than 40 boys and about 12 or 11 girls. But we all run together, or at least at the same time, we all run Boys are a little bit, some of the boys are um, way ahead of us, of course, but. I like that you corrected that, that some of them are, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Not all of them, yeah. Um, And so how long have you been at school now? Uh, I arrived on campus July 31st. And what has that process been like for you? Uh, I was pretty shocked when I first got here just because there's no mountains. Mm-hmm. In Iowa, it was, that was kind of, I got off the plane and I started looking around because, like, wait, where's, you know, where's Mount Rainier? Where did it go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's definitely just in a completely different environment. But I've been able to adjust really well because of the support system Iowa Central has here for their athletes and also my team being so easy to be around it hasn't been much of an issue at all. Mm-hmm. And classes as well, like figuring out that whole balance between school and athletics and, you know, do you, do you feel like everything's going well so far? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The coaches really make an effort. They check your grades every day, I'm pretty sure. And they know when you're absent, maybe even before the teacher does, it seems like they really are on top of the student's and know which students need support, and they get that support for them, along with you know, study t- study tables and things like that. It's really, for me anyways, it feels almost impossible to not do well here. Mm-hmm. 
And what's your plan? Are you going to be there for two years and then look for uh, like how are you going to switch to a, f- a four year school at some point? Or what's your plan for both your running career and your education? Um, right now, I'm majoring in human services just because right as of right now, it seems where you know my passions are. Mm-hmm. For running, I definitely plan to transfer to a four year school when I'm ready. I think that will be in two years just because I'd like to get the most out of my as I can out of this amazing program. Yeah, for sure. And I'm really hoping to continue running competitively and, you know, see where I can take my running as far as running out of four year and representing, you know, native people and native issues as well. And I've seen that you, um, you already do um, represent those issues at different conferences and speaking engagements. Um, how have those come about and what have those experiences been like for you? Um, yeah, different conferences. Like, um, I think one of the more recent ones was uh, the National Tribal Child Support Association Conference in California. And when they reached out to me, I was really surprised because I didn't think anybody would really want to hear from me or I didn't think that they would believe I was qualified to speak at a conference like that. But um, I was really just shocked in general. But after I realized, you know, this is what I need to speak about, um, I spent a lot of time preparing myself to make sure that you know, their faith in me wasn't, you know, was it wrong or, mm-hmm. you know, that I could those expectations and those standards and it's been really life-changing to be able to travel to these conferences and meet these people who care about these issues and in a way that, you know, I can hopefully help inspire or help heal or even just talk through some of the issues with other people who who care about it. Yeah. One of the things that makes me really hopeful about the generations that are coming up is that I do get a sense that people feel like they have a voice and that there is a lot of room for young people to step up, to speak up, to um, come together and use their voices collectively. So I'm, it makes me really happy to see people knowing that how powerful you are, even if the power feels small, because it's not. It's just a matter of you know, everyone's smaller voices coming together to make one larger voice. And it, yeah, it just brings me a lot of joy to see people of all different um, backgrounds and, and fighting for different causes to be stepping up. Like I'm really inspired um, by what's happening with the climate um, movement and the, the rallies this past week. I'm really proud of the students that from Parkland, like it's just great to see young people in general realizing that one, they're a lot more smarter than most adults are. And two, like there are people out there that want to listen to them and to support them. Right. And I definitely, that's kind of real with this generation coming up. It almost feels like a lot of us don't really have a choice but to fight for these issues. And I think also with this generation that we're finding ways to inspire each other with the things that we care about and the things that we're doing. Yeah. Is it frustrating to you that the adults ahead of you haven't taken care of these problems already because they're not new? There are some issues that have been presented before and they weren't quite acknowledged. Mm -hmm. I will say that, you know, with these platforms that are being created for youth to speak, it's been a lot easier for and these protections, for example, if I had done what I, if I had ran in my race with paint over my mouth 50 years ago, they could have easily kicked me out and I wouldn't really have much of a say against it. But now in this kind of, I have these protections where I can, I can protect myself from that type of discrimination. Whereas I know other people who may have been advocating for these issues didn't have as much protection or didn't have as many ways to protect themselves from that kind of discrimination and that those methods to silence them. Mm-hmm. So when you're not running and when you're not an advocate for missing and murdered indigenous women, what are you doing? 
Like what, what is the rest of your life look like and comprise of? Well, uh, I spend a lot of my time when I'm not, when I'm not um, either working on things or my next presentation or making connections and things like that. Um, I'm either finishing and making sure that I have a good GPA or I do spend a lot of my, not only training, but recovering my body Mm -hmm. because the type of training that we go through, you will not make it through if you don't spend an extra hour just recovering from those workouts. Yep. And I also spend a lot of time with my team in general, team bonding and going out for movie nights and things like that, or smoothies and really just spending time with each other. It's kind of surprising to me how I don't really get tired of my team that much. Yep. Just all this time that we spend together. So I'm really grateful to be able to spend time with those these kinds of people mm-hmm. along with just keeping in touch with home and you know talking to I get a little homesick every once in a while but keeping in touch with my family and counting down the days till I get to go see them again. When when do you get to see them next? Um October October 26th, I believe. Um, I'm flying in back to Seattle for my TED Talk, and that's when I'll also be able to get to see them. Um, for people who want to see your TED Talk, where where are you having it, and what are the dates, and how can they get tickets? Um, so it's TEDx Youth in Seattle. Uh, I'm not sure the exact address, but it's on October 27th, and all of the tickets and address and information, I'm pr- pretty sure it would just be on TEDx Youth. Seattle, mm-hmm. like their website. Is that going to be one of the biggest stages you've had to to give a talk so far? I uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, it was, uh, it's definitely something I've been putting a lot of time into, and I still plan to put even more time into. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see it. So I'm, I look forward <laughs> to. You. Yeah, it's it's um. I'm always impressed when. Um, Young people are so eloquent, and um, you've definitely impressed me in that way. Um, and I think, you know, there's so many, most people don't even know that there's this epidemic for the missing and murdered women. And when people, people who are just finding out about this now, you know, what can they do to support, um, you know, support the mission and support uh, making change in this area? Like, you know, anyone listening, what can they do right now to to support you and support the mission? For me, um, it's really just with that visibility. I know that there's not a lot of people who live nearby reservations or maybe they don't even know anybody who's Indigenous, but just little things like standing up against Native mascots and, or even I've seen people and instructors put land acknowledgments in their syllabuses for classes. So for example, like at Green River College, one of my professors put a land acknowledgement saying this land is belonging to or historically belonging to Muckleshoot Nation, Muckleshoot Indian Nation. And Mm -hmm. those kinds of things that really increase the visibility. And even though you might not be directly amplifying the voice of Native Americans, you're amplifying our visibility. Yeah. And it's, I would definitely say, you know, standing up against native mascots, standing up against, you know, these tropes and these stereotypes that you'll see and hear about, about native people. Mm -hmm. I think those, that is really powerful. Um, Not just to the person that you're standing up to or the person that you're educating, but also, you know, for me and for my community and for indigenous communities as a whole. Yeah. To know that there's somebody there who's who cares about our issues as well. For people who want to learn more about indigenous cultures in general and ones that are by them, like what do you recommend they do? I would definitely recommend maybe first just finding some. There's um, a lot of social media platforms like Indian Country Today and these kinds of news articles that definitely keep people up to date. Mm-hmm with um, with the issues surrounding Native people now, as well as maybe even, you know, if 
you're aware of a native school or a native area around there, just volunteering or anything like that. And really just getting some time with, you know, native youth and the native community and understanding that this is how native youth feel and then finding, okay, well, how can I, how can I encourage and how can I support these voices? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's so many, every tribe um, and indigenous culture, just like cultures around the world in general, like they're all so fascinating and interesting. Like I think the fact that you have the opportunity to speak your um, tribal language is huge because I know that there's many that the language has been lost. Yeah, and it's definitely my language in particular um, has taken a lot of reclaiming and it, and it was for a moment um, in danger, very in danger, but through um, the, the efforts of the community, we've been able to you know, reclaim it and revive, and revive it. And what is your, the name of your language? Um, the Mukoshu language is Koshu speech. And is it tied, is it linked to other um, native languages in the Northwest, or is it uh, unique in its uh, origin? Uh, I would say that it's similar to other tribes in, the, in, the, in that region of Washington. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's almost like different dialects. Yep. Like Southern Hoshutseed and Northern Hoshutseed and so on. But our language, my language in particular, has almost nothing in common with like the Lakota, um, right. the language that the Lakota Nation uses, for example, like our language, because we're so far apart, mm-hmm. is very different. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Are you um, are you guys working with um, linguists to preserve and record the language as well? Uh, yes, my mom actually is um, a teacher and protector of the Kushuti language, and she works with various elders to um, record and preserve the Hoshuki language. So you come from a long line of powerful ladies is what I hear. Uh, yeah, I'd like to think so. Yeah, my um, my grandma and my mom are definitely not people that you want to mess with. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean when you hear, when, when I call you a powerful lady, what does that mean to you and what do you hear? Um. For me to, you know, be called powerful isn't really something that I am called often. So it really makes me feel, you know, I guess strong in a way. Good. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, we, I started Powerful Ladies a couple of years ago with the intention to let everyone see how powerful like they are, right? Like the light that shines in you, how powerful it can be. And that Mm -hmm. if I can assist people in shining, showing them like where their light is and and empowering them to shine it brighter, that it's in turn going to have a ripple effect where someone else finds their light. And like if it, it, you pay it forward, right? So I love the idea of just giving people whatever tools and resources support community they need to shine brighter and to be living the biggest life that they can, that they want to. When you mm-hmm. think about yourself in, you know, five, 10 years, what do you hope to be doing? Like, what do you hope that um, your life becomes and, and kind of what are you working towards? Like, do you know what you want? You talked about being in, in service. So like, what do you see your future being? as of now. And of course it's going to change so much because that's what life does. But what do you see right now? (laughs) Um, For me right now, I know that whatever career that I do take on, it's going to be one that's either representing or helping support native communities, just because that's been my passion since I've been really young. Mm -hmm. And I know also that competitively or collegiately, or even just recreationally, I know that I want to keep running as well. Yeah, and that's one of the great sports because you really can do it forever. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, have you heard of the Ragnar races? Oh, no, I haven't. Oh, you would love them. So they happen all around the U.S., and it's a race where you have a team of 12, 
and mm -hmm. everybody runs three times. So you run 200 miles as a team. It's like a big relay. And oh, that's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it's super fun. So when you guys are off season, I'm sure like, you guys should look at one to do together. Um, and they do them like uh, road, road races, but they also do them trail races. And I've done a couple. And this November, I'm doing my first trail um, race like mm -hmm. that. And I'm really nervous because I am not a trail runner. At least that's what I think right now. Um, you know, as a, a woman who, a, you know, a white woman who grew up in suburbia, uh, I was mm -hmm. always told, like, don't run at night and don't run in the woods by yourself. And mm -hmm. so on this race, I have to do both of those things. Um, <laughs> so it's like, wait, I'm allowed to run in the dark in the woods? Like, so there's that whole element of just fear of that. And like the mm -hmm. idea that I might run off a cliff or be attacked by wild animals, let alone like creepy people in the woods. So yeah. there's so many layers to this race beyond just the running part. With time, especially, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of miles to adjust. I will say um, night trail running, It will, I think it will definitely, this is just my hunch, I think it will definitely kind of suck you in. You might you might not want to stop by the time that, you know, you get to where you need to be. It's um, It can also be really empowering as a woman to know that you've been told not to run at night, and yet you are, kind mm -hmm. of, and I'm okay. There's that kind of thing that also, it might, for that moment, for this race, or for that leg, I guess, might be something that might be hopefully hopefully um, empowering to you. Well, I'm certainly going to be thinking of you when I'm doing this race now. <laughs> Thank you. So if, if the team that I'm running with, if we wanted to dedicate our run to the missing and murdered Indigenous women, how could we do that in a way that would be respectful as none of us that I'm aware of are Native? Um, I think that's something that I would pers I would talk to, um, you know, maybe see if there's somebody, um, a relative or somebody in your community or somebody in the team's community that knows um, a Native American who can kind of connect you to the issue. Yeah, perfect. Just because it's very difficult, and I know that there's a lot of supporters who do want to be... Um, Supporting this issue, it can just be very close to appropriation at times, depending on how the paint is worn or for sure things like that. All right, that's great advice. I will ask around. I know that um, yeah. my boyfriend's sister-in-law is Native, so maybe I'll start by asking her. I think I'll see her tonight. Yeah, so um, definitely one thing that can be really difficult, and I know it's, like, it's really um, a blurry lines with allies, is just it can be very touchy to represent Native Americans, but without the actual backing of a Native American. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Uh, it totally makes sense. Yep. So I would definitely, well, I would know what your intentions are. I would just, it's also like a way to protect you and you know how people would perceive um, your team's yeah attempt. Yeah, because I, I we don't we want to do like. If we choose to take that on, we want to do it to empower. We don't want to do it to make a controversial story or take away from the point or anything negative, right? So I love. I think that you're giving great advice about how to do it in the appropriate way and how to do it in the right way so that you're helping, not hurting the, the mm -hmm. cause. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's a very challenging subject right now with appropriation across all ethnicities of how do you support and honor cultures that aren't yours without being right. rude. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a big topic because, um, you know, I, I grew up, I remember I was talking to Jordan about this, about um, for one Halloween, I was Jasmine from mm -hmm. the Disney Aladdin movie. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a white girl with red hair, right? The farthest yeah. you can be from looking like Jasmine. But yeah. I loved it and I wanted to be her. So, of course, Disney makes like 80 million costumes of everything. So I could just go and like buy one off the shelf. But in hindsight, I'm like, I don't know. Is this, is that inappropriate? Like how do, especially kids who are so innocent, right? Mm 
mm-hmm. there's there there's not a malicious intent. Um, like it's I think it's a really tricky subject now of how do you get to honor and and uh, you know admire different cultures than yours without being inappropriate. Right, and I think that's one thing that um, is just very touchy because of the. I'm not really sure if you've ever heard of like the white savior complex, mm-hmm. where it can be very um, difficult just for you know um, non-whites to trust their representation just with other people that aren't their ethnicity because there's just been such a terrible history of misrepresentation. Yes, that it it just makes it very difficult to to know. Okay, well, what is appropriate and who really also has I guess the right to speak about these issues yeah and and who and who has right intentions and who doesn't and all mm-hmm. of it all of it yeah it's it's a very messy tangled thing that we all have to deal with together right mm-hmm. and you know I would definitely like um, I would actually if you don't mind love to stay in touch and if there's any way I can help with that you know with that journey and I could even when, honestly, when it comes to things that I don't know about, I, I ask my mentor, um, yeah. Jordan Daniel, and I say, what do, you, what, do you, what do you think? You know, can you, can you help me out here? This is what I'm thinking, but I'm also, you know, kind of on this side of this thing. And she really, she's really um, experienced with these kinds of, these kinds of um, situations. Well, I absolutely want to stay in touch because I, th- I think you are um, a fascinating and amazing mm-hmm. and once you're a powerful lady, you're always a powerful lady in this world. So, um, for sure. And I would be honored for for you to guide me through some of these tricky subjects. And I think too, having um, Jordan as a guest would also be super powerful. Yes, yeah, she's um, she's really amazing. There's, I don't know how she does everything. Like every, whenever people compliment me, I just say no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> this is who I'm actually learning from, and you know, who's really given me you know the strength and the opportunity to develop so yeah, in, she's awesome I don't know how she does all the stuff she does so in addition to Jordan no I was going to say powerful ladies learn from powerful ladies so yes yeah mm-hmm. absolutely in addition to Jordan and your mother and grandmother who are other women that inspire you um, I think for sure like the multiple um, women in my community that are keeping my traditions alive mm-hmm. and who are leading my community. So um, I have, you know, my friend's parents who are preserving, you know, the traditional nutritional values and who will make traditional foods and really teach us about um, nutrition and how we feed our bodies in a way that heals not only, not only heals us physically, but spiritually and, you know, through our, through our traditions and, a lot of Native women, Indigenous women who are leading the fight um, through, like, these social and political issues, but also in keeping traditions alive and leading our communities and raising their communities. I think as much as Native women are exposed to violence, they're also resilient. For sure. I I would say that there are many women in this world and who who aren't getting enough credit for how resilient they are. Yes, absolutely. It, it's, um, I think that there is something really special happening in general where so many women around the world are finding their, their voice and their niche. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was reading an article the other day about, um, I think the hashtag, and forgive me if I'm getting it wrong, I'll put the correct one, for everyone listening in our show notes, but I believe it's the hashtag, like uh, just the hashtag brown women and how women Mm -hmm. from um, India in particular and uh, the Indian background are taking it on to really show that yes, culturally with, there's a lot of um, stereotypes, but like look at everything else we're doing. You know, there's Mm -hmm. the woman who is uh, the first woman of late night, you know, and she is, um, you know, Canadian, and she is of um, 
a, a, a minority and she is LGBTQ and she, you know, is female. Like all these boxes got checked at once for a late night program. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah, so what? Like I'm all these things. And so are most people like that. It's not mm -hmm. like we represent one box ever. So I think it's really, right. really cool to see what's happening and. Um, I look forward to seeing like what happens next, right? Like I grew up thinking I could do whatever I wanted and I, and to think that there is like a, another level that that can go for the next generation, I find fascinating. Mm -hmm. yeah, I really appreciate, you know, especially, um, I'm personally, is, um, I'm a queer native woman. And so it's kind of, um, can be really difficult to explain the type of intersectional like experiences that we have, mm -hmm. and especially with, you know, the na the murdered, missing um, Indigenous women epidemic, it is a intersectional issue between um, race and gender, and also, you know, it does come sexual orientation and even, um, you know, economic status and these kinds of. Yep. A lot of people really kind of neglect the intersectional issues that come along with these kinds of problems. For sure. It's so much easier to put us in a box and to say it's this way or that way. It's left or it's right mm -hmm. and not have to look at the fact that everyone is overlapping concentric circles that makes you you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Is, does that add like um, how is it being um, identifying as a queer indigenous woman? Like how does that impact you within the indigenous community? Um, in my indigenous community, um, and that identifying as queer is really, um, really doesn't make much of a difference, I would say, in my, my community and my reservation. How awesome. However, um, in other, outside of my community, it can be really challenging, um, or especially, you know, when I am in a relationship with another woman, it becomes um, very intimidating to spend time with my partner at that time when in public and in certain areas, we won't even present as dating yeah. just because there's been so many verbal and or even nonverbal kind of confrontations mm -hmm. that come with that. And I think it really just makes you even more vulnerable or exposes you even more to that kind of violence. Yes. Yeah, you already have to do, you already have to be protective as a female. And then the statistics show you have to be extra protective if you're native and female. And then mm -hmm. you layer on another of, um, you know, falling into LGBTQ status. So, you know, when you look at having three layers of things that you have to pr be prepared to protect yourself for, um, right. I mean, does it occur as overwhelming ever, or is it just what so, and that's what you're working to change the world about? Um, I definitely say that at times it really can be overwhelming, uh, especially in the way that, you know, I'm finding myself over-sexualized in certain ways, you know, over-sexualized when I'm in a relationship with another girl, or over-sexualized in Halloween costumes, right, the, the Pocahontas, mm -hmm. and over-sexualized as a woman yep. in general, and through you know, seeing constant types of media, if I'm not being over, if I'm not being, you know, fetishized in some way through being queer or through being native, I'm still, a, I'm still a woman. I still present and as a woman. So yeah. that, it really is sometimes no break to the way I'm perceived as sexual, even if I really don't want to be. Right. Yep. Yeah. It's uh, I, that's probably not talked about enough, right? Of mm -hmm. how it just keeps showing up, and you're like, I'm so many other things. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or like, this isn't exactly what about my identity that I wanted you to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's um, it's the, it, there's so many small, there's small in um in quantity but they're they can be large in magnitude of how all the images you see throughout a day they start to they add up right right um, yeah I'm really proud with how it's been changing in regards to imagery of women uh, as athletes mm -hmm. you know I think that there's there's a lot of good work happening of, of showing 
the variety of female athletes in regards to shape and sizes and colors and um, orientations mm-hmm. and all of that. And, you know, um, I really enjoy just watching like the, the Women's World Cup this year and mm-hmm. seeing um, what the, the Team USA did to like back up the things they stood for by playing great and playing great together. Um, And then, yeah, there's just so many in the running community in general, when it's, when there's so many people taking up that sport and so, and so many different types of runners. um, Mm -hmm. I, I like that it's a, it's one of the sports that there's mutual respect because of how everyone knows how hard you have to work and how much you have to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, you as an athlete, what do you focus on to perform at your best? Like, do you follow Um, a strict nutritional diet, like all that stuff? Uh, for me, uh, it's definitely like taking care of myself first. So I wouldn't say that I'm restricted with my diet, but I am inclusive in the sense that I know that I'm getting healthy foods. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily, while I do, I might look at the donut and say, what is that really going to do for me? Yeah, I definitely wouldn't say that I really, you know, torture myself in the sense that, like, um, for example, my team, my teammate brought donuts after the meet. I'm not going to, especially after the meet, I'm not going to say no. Like, you can't <laughs> give me this donut. I'm on this very strict diet, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or like, I make waffles on Sundays, that kind of thing. But um, I definitely don't. I wouldn't say that I like gorge on anything or binge eat. And then I do make sure that with my meals that I'm getting healthy foods and vegetables and fruits. Just because I know that it makes me feel better when I run and when I compete, mm-hmm. along with just getting a normal, adequate amount of sleep and those things and like drinking enough water. So I wouldn't say necessarily that I'm strict with what I do as much as I am just, I prioritize taking care of myself. Yeah. Good. Mm-hmm. Everyone should, right? Yeah. Running just makes it a little bit easier because you kind of feel like you have to. Yes. Yeah. There's a... <laughs> When uh, when you're when you need your body as your machine, it becomes really evident that you have to take care of it. Yeah, for sure. We ask everyone on the podcast where you put yourself on the powerful lady scale: zero being average everyday human, and ten being super powerful lady. Where do you see yourself on average, <laughs> and where do you see yourself today? Um, I definitely say that. As, as weird, I guess, as that sounds, that I would consider myself average and not necessarily to debunk anything that I've done or to you know, diminish anything that I've done or the work that I've put in, but to say that I think that the amount of impact that I can make is equal to any average woman. Perfect. And then <laughs> as we're wrapping up today... What do you want people to know, um, and what message do you want to leave everyone with? Um, I would say that, you know, as somebody who feels silenced or somebody in a minority group in any kind of way through sexual orientation, through gender, or through race, or even through um, adaptive abilities, knowing that uh, you do have a platform and that you do have opportunity in your everyday life and through the things that you love and just paying attention to the activists around you to the powerful women around you, you can find ways to, you'll, you'll be surprised how easily inspired and moved you are to do something yourself. I love it. Well, I am so <laughs> honored that you are a yes to the powerful Ladies podcast. I am so proud of yeah. who uh, you are and what you're up to and how much you've already accomplished that I look so forward to staying in touch and supporting you and um, giving you whatever resources I have access to, to help magnify what you're up to and support you. Um, This has been such a pleasure and um, good luck at your next race and good luck at your TEDx. And um, yeah, you are incredible. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And I really enjoyed talking to you as well.
Between Rosalie Fish and Greta Thornburg, I hope that the so-called adults in this world are waking up to the fact that we are not doing enough to leave the world a better place. We should be ashamed that it is the newest generation that is calling all of us out to step up and be brave and make the decisions that we know need to be made. Rosalie is 18 and so well-spoken, so powerful, so graceful, and proudly taking on the weight of Native causes. It's not easy to be the face and represent a group to which you are just one member, and she is doing an amazing job. If you're inspired and motivated by Rosalie, you can. Buy tickets to her upcoming TEDx Youth Talk in Seattle. Tickets are available through the link in the show notes at PowerfulLadies.com. Reach out to Native and Indigenous people in your community and provide opportunities for them to have a platform to tell their story and for their voices to be heard. You can also email her directly at rosaliefish at gmail.com and follow her on Instagram at rosaliefishx. Of course, please go to thepowerfulladies.com to see all of the show notes that we have for this episode, get correct spellings, direct links, and all the additional information. If you'd like to support the work that we're doing here at Powerful Ladies, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Leave a review on any of these platforms. Share the show with all the powerful ladies and gentlemen in your life. Join our Patreon account. Check out the website, thepowerfulladies.com to hear more inspiring stories, get practical tools to be your most powerful, get 15% off your first order in the Powerful Ladies shop, or donate to the Powerful Ladies One Day of Giving campaign. And of course, follow us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. For show notes and to get the links to the books, podcasts, and people we talk about, go to thepowerfulladies.com. I'd like to thank our producer, composer, and audio engineer, Jordan Duffy. She's one of the first female audio engineers in the podcasting world, if not the first. And she also happens to be the best. We're very lucky to have her. She's a powerful lady in her own right, in addition to taking over the podcasting world. She's a singer-songwriter working on her next album, and she's one of my sisters. So it's amazing to be creating this with her, and I'm so thankful that she finds time in her crazy busy schedule to make this happen. It's a testament to her belief in what we're creating through Powerful Ladies, and I'm honored that she shares my vision. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. I can't wait for you to hear it. Until then, I hope you're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love.